It's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode number 224, Australia's Biggest New Car Fails. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James Cleary, and joining me and looking at these infamous flops are key contributing journalists, Andrew Chesterton in Austin, Texas. Howdy. And Byron Matthew Darkus in Brunswick, Victoria. G'day. We'll also take a look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and dive into your feedback. YouTubers, you can jump ahead to each section of the show via the time codes in the notes or chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. Chesto, you authored uh, this story earlier in the week, Australia's Biggest New Car Fails, and we're not confining ourselves to Aussie-made cars. This is about models, even brands, that just didn't cut it in our market. And you made the point that, generally speaking, car companies get it pretty right most of the time, but uh, in some notorious cases, they didn't. Yes. Look, they pay a lot lot of people a lot of money to get it right, but that's no guarantee of constant success. There's always going to be a couple of furfies in there. And I must admit, this is a collective effort. Well, a plenty of the Cars Guide team threw some names into this list. But also, I should point out that these cars aren't necessarily global failures. Some of them are, but some of them, we're really just focusing on their success in Australia, right? So I've picked five of quite a long list that I thought were probably the biggest ones. And the name that is probably the most familiar and is sitting at the top of the list at the moment is the Holden ZB Commodore. Now, you'll remember this came at a really difficult time for Holden. The factories were closed. We were no longer building Commodores in Australia. They wanted a new vehicle to launch and they found one in Opel, GM's sort of German brand and a rebadged ins- insignia that they called the ZB Commodore. And that was no V8 in sight. There was no rear powered option. It was in a different category of car altogether. And look, to say that the Commodore Faithful responded to it with some <laughs> hatred would be yeah. a slight uh, understatement. So, and look, I maintain it was actually a pretty good car. The, the, the critical mistake Holden made in this instance was, was calling it a Commodore. People felt like they were having the, the wall pulled over their eyes and look, it just didn't fly. So to put that into some sort of perspective, it, it, it holds the not so great honor of being the, the most short, the, the shortest lived Commodore of all time. It lasted, I, right. I think lasted just under two years, I think from memory and uh, before it was yeah. then scrapped. And then not long after it, holding itself was scrapped. So it might have been uh, a Byron, just, just, to, just to, to chip in, Byron, what did you make at the time of Holden's decision to continue the Commodore nameplate? What, what were your thoughts? Uh, I thought that, seemed to have been a two-way bet whether okay. you know, that like they were hedging their bets thinking well the cars changed so profoundly um it will just be alien to traditional commodore base but then people like the fleet buyers that tend to buy uh, large sedans and wagons as well as um holden aficionados who just want a holden badge car and they're the yeah. ones that ended up buying things like holden apollos and you know yeah, yeah. holden epicas and all that sort of stuff um that would just buy anything with a lion badge i th- they probably banked on those people to 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 back the zb commodore up right but so uh, a holden yeah. insignia a holden insignia would have been even worse it would have been commercially uh commercially but you know the reality is it was an insignia it was an it was a opal insignia a car which by the way has a direct lineage to the holding chimera the chimera became the cavalier the cavalier became the vectra the vectra became the insignia and the insignia is still around today as a as a vox yeah, so, yeah. um or as an opal so yes. um so yeah it it was a, a, of course history showed it to be a completely disastrous move because it offended the diehard well, the other thing was, mm. and Chesto, one of the most obvious changes was to front-wheel drive. Yes, there was an all-wheel drive model, but that was just a yeah. fundamental thing. And a lot of the people bleating about the change to front-wheel drive, I dare say, were not, at that point, Commodore customers. They, they were more no, exactly. look, looking in their mirrors rather than looking ahead, you know? Mate, 100%. But look, I feel a little bit more strongly about it than Byron. I think it was a catastrophic error, and, and I know that because... Ford took the opposite approach where they said, we're so proud of the Falcon. It's done great stuff for us. We're now retiring that nameplate. It will always have its place in Australian history, but it's no more. And overnight, they became the Ford Ranger and Ford Mustang company, while Holden for years struggled on as the company that was trying to sell the not-so-Commodore Commodore. Commodore. It just, it was so much baggage to move into a new era. They should have just left it behind. Which is a double edge. Well, no, it's a double whammy, really, isn't it? Because you've got move away from sedans and wagons, 
and the disrespect for what the Commodore had become. So, um, yes, Falcon went, uh, Ranger became the big deal for Ford. Yeah, I take your point completely. Yeah, But, but two things to remember first, it was a mm. damn good car. It was yeah, yeah it nothing was, wrong with the car. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for all practical purposes, it was a better car than the car it replaced. And I love the VF Commodore. I owned a VF yeah. Evoque wagon. Brilliant I think car. Nothing, and I mean, in some ways, it was not a patch on the VF Commodore because it didn't offer the the breadth of performance and uh, and I guess versatility when you're taking the HSVs. Um, but the other thing is that the ZB Commodore uh, was always going to be doomed because it just wasn't made in Australia. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah, and exactly. Holden, and that left Holden with yeah. nothing to hang its hat on. Yeah. Um, you know, it was always no. the Australian brand. Yeah, anyway, that's good. That's a good start. We're flying. Okay, Chesto, uh, number two on now, the flopperoo scale, please. Mate, the next one is like big bang levels of catas- catastrophic stuff up. So it's the Mercedes Benz X Class. It's probably, yep. I'd hazard a guess to say, the most expensive mistake on this list. Mm-hmm. It was when Mercedes charged headfirst into building the world's first premium pickup, the X Class, but rather than build it, they took a Nissan Navara, tweaked it around the edges in the suspension, put a star badge on the front. And, and thought they would sell by the fistful. And I must admit, I, I got it wrong too. I thought the X-Class would be a success. I really did. Mm. Uh, but it, it wasn't. No. I, I, uh, it, I was going to say, not for the first time uh, that I've mentioned it, I often mistook them for Navaras in traffic. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, mean, yeah. I know there'd been, particularly from the rear, cosmetic tweaks and whatever, I just thought it was a Navara. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be a dissenting voice here because, A, the car sold well in Australia, but only in Australia. Everywhere else in the world, it was it bombed. Um, and B, that car with the V6 Mercedes engine and transmission right. actually elevated the vehicle to where, somewhere where you would might expect a Mercedes badge to well, be. Chester, yeah. you called out the numbers, didn't you, in terms of uh, yeah, globally and num- locally? The numbers are incredible. Well, no, no. I, so the global numbers, put it this way, in, in, in 2019, for example, the year before it was scrapped, yep. Toyota sold... 47,759 Hiluxes in Australia. Yeah. That same year, Mercedes sold just over 15,000 X classes around the globe. Everywhere. So, like, it, it, it was just utterly unsustainable numbers. And, Byron, I take your point completely. But for mine, I think the mistake they made was not launching with that engine. They When that when that car first appeared, it appeared with N- Nissan everything, basically. We had to wait for the six. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it was an interesting strategy. But, but I, I tried to sort of do a rough calculation on the numbers to be honest with you i couldn't even get close but it, we would be talking a very large number that exercise for mercedes it would have a lot of zeros behind it oh, all yeah. of which was promptly down the gurgler yes yes indeed there all right that's effect. that's yes the gurgler sound effect thank you very much Brian. <laughs> um now um, no, i do have that sound effect beautiful there goes the it next class um now <laughs> uh chesto number three Number three is the Honda CRZ or Z, if you prefer, hybrid. Now, it, it launched in Australia towards the end of 2011. It, it, you know, it had a bit of hype around it. In fact, it won a really prestigious car magazine's car of the year in 2011. Or 2011, 2012, yep. I can't, I, 2011. I can't remember. Yep. 2011, there you go. And, and it was this funky little sports car. It was a hybrid with a manual. It was the first time we'd really seen that combination. Problem is, where it, the, the performance was never really there. It, it made 100 kilowatts. It had a nine second sprint to 100 kilometers an hour and it struggled. I mean, in its first year, it did okay, 370 uh, sales total. The next year, 20, uh, 2012, sorry, that was its first full year of sales. 2013, though, by 2013, those numbers had dropped to 58 units total yes. across the course of the year. Yes. By the beginning of 2015, off with its head. So yes. the CRZ, you're on my list. Is it, here's, here's the thought bubble. Is it is it a more affordable version of BMW's i8? You know, he was he was a car that professed to be a sports car but wasn't very sporty. Here's an i8 that professes to be a supercar but didn't quite get there in terms Isn't of all that super. performance. It's not that super. Yeah. Byron, you're shaking yeah, your yeah. head. Look, I, again, Andrew is completely correct. I completely agree with you. With you. Uh, however, that car was also ahead of its time. I mean, if it was released today under the COVID restriction um, uh, and, and pandemic um limitations and supply issues and all that sort of stuff, it probably they would probably sell 110, not 52. Now, full disclosure no. here, Byron, you happen to be on the panel of people that elected said car to that accolade uh, yes, in period, uh, were you that's not? That's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, okay. For uh, 
I, I was, and uh, in my defence, I did not, I did not uh, uh, want that card to be card of the year. But um, there, that was a democracy in terms of other judges uh, voting that through. Okay. I, I just thought that card was a little bit too expensive, a little bit too. Um, it, right. it was quite old by 2011. The card was launched in 2000, and I want to say 2008 globally, in late mm. 2008. So okay, yeah. Mm. So you, that's a fair. That's half life, isn't it? Really? Yeah. 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 Mm. All right. Good one. Number four is a cracker, Chesto. I like this one a lot. As in, I like yes. the car and I like the choice. Go for it. Yeah. Now, this is one that I, I, I'm, I'm going with Byron here. This one I do think was simply ahead of its time. It was the Renault Zoe, which was, as I wrote in that story, I, I think partly fell victim to just being early to the electrification yeah. party in Australia. It, it, it touched down around the middle of 2017 when EVs were very much a distant thought. You know, really the take up of EVs has only heavily accelerated in the last couple of years. 2017, we're talking minuscule numbers. It, it had a driving range of around 300 kilometres and it was under 50 grand, which as we know for an EV is, is, is pretty good value. They're in their own value scale. Obviously, everything's comparative, but it's not bad. It wasn't bad value. Look, it had been proven popular overseas. Renault hoped it would prove popular here. It wasn't. It, it sold 63 units and that's yes. not a year that's over its entire three-year run yes Sur surprise surprising absolutely nobody it was then plucked from sale too so zoe you're on my list not because you were necessarily a bad car but because you were perhaps early to the ev party what about you byron i i enjoyed driving the zoe i mm. thought it was a terrific little car mm. but mm. um yes it's just nice car wrong time kind yeah. of deal so that was europe's best-selling electric car for most of the last decade um the issue with that car in Australia is that it relied on AC only charging. And as a result, yeah. you couldn't use DC chargers right. to... Um, Good point. And that's been rectified since with the uh, new generation, Zoe. But in effect, that, that dated and, um, and antiquated the car. Yeah. And it, well, you're right. It was a great, fun car to drive. It was actually reasonably good value for money given the price of electric cars back in the day. But... Yeah, it was never going to fly. I also thought car. it looked nice. I thought it was a really cute little car. But um, anyway, mm. that's just me. And thank you. So, Chesto, we're going to step it up. We, we're moving from just a particular model. We're going an entire brand here. Please uh, fill us in. Yeah. Lucky last for this one. And look, I take no joy in this because I know some of the people that work there and they were, they were doing a great job. Really, no, no fault yep. of their own. But yep. so the aforementioned Opal of, of famed ZB Commodore slash Insignia fame, it launched in Australia to much fanfare. August 2012, brand new brand. We're bringing back the Astra, a nameplate Australians know and love. Huge plans for our market. 20 dealerships, 15,000 sales they were targeting, which, to be honest with you, is a fairly reasonable sales target. Mm -hmm. Look, unfortunately, Unfortunately, it sold closer to a thousand units in total, so it didn't quite crack the fifteen thousand. And at, at just yeah. around twelve months later, in fact, I think a touch under twelve months later, it was gone. Yeah. So really, did was wasn't given much time to bet in. Now they they blamed changing goalposts and 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 business unsustainable business models for its rapid departure. But look, eleven or twelve months is no time to bet in a brand. But no. it's also I I would hazard a guess as to say. It's, probably holds the title of being the most short-lived brand in Australia's history, Opal. Yeah. And it was gone. 2013, see you later. Do you know, uh, Byron, I reckon there's a couple of things here. Um, the thing I found galling was that there was so much chat amongst the pre-launch hype about we are here for the long haul. You know, it won't be yeah. easy. We're going to establish this brand, which proved to be utter rubbish. Um, and the other, um, let's escape me for a sec. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Byron, you were going to say something? Yeah. Um, Holden didn't want Opal in Australia. It was simply yes, an in-house competitor. That's reminded me. Yep. Uh, competing against its most uh, important models. Uh, the small, at the time, small cars were very popular, so they had an Astra coming up against a Cruze, which was being made in Australia. It was a better car than a Cruze. It, it, it was another example of General Motors in Detroit simply forcing the, their hand on the market that they just didn't know or care enough about. about. Well, the, 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 you mentioned it there. The, the, the Astra had been kicked from pillar to post before it even appeared as an Opal. Mm. And then it reappeared amazingly as a Holden yeah. again after that. That is a nameplate yeah. that was just given a thrashing over a long period of time. Towards exactly. The and as a postscript to what we started off with, the ZB Commodore, then Holden adopted the insignia name as a slap in the face for Opal as well. I know. Um, for the short lived VXR version, which was actually quite a good car. Because they, they had Astra, Corsa, yeah. and Insignia. And, and the, Zephira. And so the OP. Had, sorry, they also had 
30 units of the Zafira. Oh, it's 30. Okay. And the car was uh, the car was actually unofficially launched, and you can still buy second-hand, second-generation, third-generation Zafiras in Australia. So that must have been just before the pin was pulled, yep. and uh, they, they had 30 in the country. Mm. But the, the high-performance OPC cars were really great. You know, um, they, they stood up to cars like a Sirocco or a uh, Megane um, RS in period. Uh, yeah, it was just launching yeah. a fresh brand that no one knows anything about takes enormous bucks and a lot of time. Look at Genesis. You know, there's Hyundai with some of the deepest pockets yeah. in the business, and they are in for the long haul, I, I think genuinely, and, and they're funding it along the way. Yeah. But you think about Infinity like, and you know all that, it takes a lot. It, even Lexus, you know, it's, it's taken Lexus a long, long time to get a kind of a, a real foothold. So it's a yeah. challenge but mate that was that whole situation i agree with you Byron. it was madness the whole thing was madness from the from the very yeah. beginning all right hey well, wouldn't it be great just quickly wouldn't it be great yeah. if um uh if stellantis goes hey let's bring opal back to australia <laughs> yeah. let's bring the astra nameplate the corsa nameplate which by the way those the corsa is one of europe's best-selling cars now it is nothing like uh the general motors era uh opals wouldn't that be wouldn't that be like a funny postscript to that let's mark that up. down yeah, let's mark great. that down as a semi prediction but uh it would be amazing uh, mate I, only if they're in it for the long haul let's see how okay. that's <laughs> now let's have a let's have a quick fire round i've i've got uh, a few others here people listening and watching will have their list i'm going to say alfa romeo the number of times I've heard the Alfa Romeo revival speech in Australia, I, I couldn't count. Yeah, we're going to start off slow. We'll get to 5,000. We'll start to knock off this brand, that brand, and, and we'll be away. Folks, buy more Julia's. Just might, hasn't, just hasn't whatever whatever uh, JC says, buy more Julia's. Yes. <laughs> They're amazing. Now, a lot of people will be there screaming at us saying, are you Falcon? Are you Falcon? All right, we hear you. And what I would what I would recommend is a Facebook page called AU Falcons Doing Incredible Things. Yeah, which it's is, awesome. Yeah. Which is an absolutely awesome Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and you know, at the time, in glorious hindsight, you can say maybe that was the beginning of the end uh, for for Falcon. It it got such a bad press at the time. But uh, what did you make of AU Falcon in period, Byron? Uh, look, the AU Falcon I think was demonstrably better than the VT Commodore as a car in terms of uh, ride and handling and um, performance yep. on that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's styling simply let it down. Um, yep. The fact that the AU Falcon was the choice of uh, taxi fleets around the country um, sh uh, is testimony to their inherent um, sh uh, strength and durability, something cool. that, that AU Falcon uh, Facebook page uh, <laughs> you know, builds upon. So okay. look, mm. I'm a fan of the AU Falcon and FYI, AU Falcons are probably starting to become collectible, like really collectible now. So here's another semi prediction. Love it. Invest in the AU. The Falcon. Yeah. Now, let's have a quick comment from you both. Uh, Leyland, Leyland P76, another particular award winner for, for you know, an, a well-known Aussie award. Uh, I, I think that this car is absolutely underrated. The V8 was ahead of its time. Uh, the styling uh, left the... Opposi uh, the opposition behind as well. The yep. car was killed by circumstances and uh, backroom shenanigans. It simply, and the fact that it wasn't built. And properly. Leyland heading downhill in Australia. Yeah, yeah. That, that car was always started behind the eight ball. It should have succeeded. It's a much better car than people say. And name me another car you can fit a 44 gallon drum, drum, drum in the boot. Off. Yeah, good point. Good oh. point. Popular in Snowtown. I uh, the other. Um, I'll take it. I'll take you back to. Uh, I'll take you back to Alfa Romeo for a moment, only yeah. because I think that's that's more than an Australian hiccup. It's a global one, and, and the reason is that there's just not enough product coming quickly enough. I don't know right. where there's this huge, I think, multi-billion-dollar euro investment in R and D, and we're building all these cars, and here they all come, and here we are years later, and we're still got Julietta's running and, and around. It's, it's, it's insane. Appropriate that you're in the states, Chester, because so much of that was driven by. Alfa Romeo relaunching in America, and it's going to be a big deal. And, yeah. Uh, no, it just hasn't fired. Well, um, the, the Tonali no. might be the last chance. Mm. Well, or tenale, it might, everyone. the Tonali might get there's, clipped. There's so much... Uh, <laughs> But there's so much goodwill for that brand. I think we all want to see it make some sort of serious comeback. You know, everyone True. loves it. <laughs> True. We'll see. Thanks for the sound effects. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> now, Sorry, not just you. a car, an engine. The Holden uh, back, I mean Starfire Four that appeared in, I want to say UC 
Sunbird, which was the four-cylinder Tirana. Am I That's correct right. in, 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 that the, in the la- latter part of 1978? And did it continue on into Chimera? Oh, no. No. Absolutely Sorry. not. How dare you? Okay. Chimera had the family <laughs> two engine. The, uh, the so engine it did, yes. that was exported in the millions globally until... So it was. Holden's years. Engine Company. Yeah, Holden's exactly. Engine Company. Yes. Yeah. All Camera, right, now... Great car. I'm glad the Chimera didn't make that list, by the way, guys, because it's a great car. Also, Ford Capri. Now, we're not talking 70s Ford Capri. We're talking 90s Ford Capri. It was the Mercury Capri in North America and an export opportunity for Ford in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Unfortunately, there were some roof leak issues. Um, There was a club sprint version, I think, that Tickford made, which was a lot of fun. But basically, the MX-5 just smashed it and and And, flattened it. It And the reason why it smashed it is because Ford Dearborn made the monumental error of uh, of not having that car engineered for airbags because it was meant to be released in 19... 1987 or early wow. 1988 which it would did take an age i remember 18 months yeah yeah so the car was delayed 18 months and it would have had that head start over the mx5 which would have made all the difference to the car so again circumstances and and and, and ridiculous american corporation mismanagement killed that yeah. car in australia nice and that one. car which obviously yeah. had a lot of mazda engineering in it mm. that car deserved to have done better um, now, he, just sticking with Ford, sounds like we're, uh, you know, ganging up on Ford, but Ford Taurus. So from 1996 to 98, Ford brought the Taurus here. And as I recall, it was part Taurus, part Mercury, it was part Ford, part Mercury amalgam that arrived here, three litre V6 front wheel drive, but it actually cost more than a Falcon. Um, and yeah. it had a small boot. It looked a bit odd. And again, to your point, odd. Byron, it was Detroit imposing itself on Australia and saying, look, we're going to put this car in market and you just watch it go. It's going to succeed. Yeah. We'll preview, prove to you how good it will be. And uh, it was exactly the opposite of that. Yes. Uh, that car was yeah. actually mooted to be the uh, replacement for the EL Falcon for 1997. Um, but uh, an American who was a Ford MD in the early 90s persuaded Detroit to give Ford one more go with the Falcon, which led to the AU Falcon, which is another story, obviously. But, <laughs> yes, but that car very list. nearly, <laughs> very nearly wore Falcon badges, and it would have been the ZB Commodore all over again, except wow, probably. And it was going to yeah, be wow. I was uh, I was on the launch of that car, and I remember driving it, thinking, I don't think this is going to go very well. And so, how prescient was that? Anyway, oh, sorry, last- fun fact: an Aussie, um, an Aussie was behind the styling of that car. Fun fact. Oh, the the um the last one I've got on this list, and we'll we'll leave it. Uh, we'll draw a line under this one because I remember is the Suzuki X90. Now the Suzuki X90, tiny little, high riding two seater, had the off road looks, yeah. and I remember driving it. And the the importer distributor that had the concession for Suzuki at that point um, had loaned the car, and I remember returning it and then getting a call after my review of the car had appeared, which was less than favourable. Yeah. And the person said, oh, look, if I knew you were going to say that about it, I wouldn't have loaned it to you. Then that's, 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 that's not quite how it works. But I, I do remember doing a, like a hard braking test on the test loop uh, that I've got, and it, it scared the bejesus out of me. I thought it was going to you know, really snap and tip over. It was dynamically tragic, that car, but quite borderline dangerous, I'd say. A two... A two- Mate, you do see them jacked up for off road now, but I, I, I do take uh, I take umbrage with the had the off road look. So I don't think straight out of the box it looked that off road ready, did it? It just no. I didn't I couldn't work out a purpose. You know, yeah, it, it, yes, okay. You, I don't know. It's a toy. It's some little toy. It's like a Barbie car, but but real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, that that car was. I mean, in, in what era in history did someone say, yeah, I think we'll have a two seater <laughs> sedan yeah. on yeah, I know. stilts, a coupe oh. style, uh, yeah. with. Uh, with a Mazda one two one bubble style front end, look, yeah, one point six liter. How many meetings did that get through where nobody said, "Guys, what, sorry, is this yeah. some sort are of you, ongoing practical?" Someone need to stand that? up at the boardroom table and say, "Are you people mad?" Yeah, 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 yeah. just some some reality check. It, it's it's almost like the Simpsons bubble car, isn't it? No one at no <laughs> point did anyone just say, "What are we doing?" Yeah. Okay. That's great. What a terrific discussion. And thank you, guys. I'm sure uh, people listening and viewing will have their thoughts. So uh, let us know what you think about Australian market uh, failures. And that's our take on it anyway. We're going to move to our garage and cars that we've been driving lately. Chesto, 
Can I start with you? First of all, just give us a quick insight into why you're in Texas and then talk about the car um, that you've been driving. Ah, so I'm here, we can't say too much about it at the moment, but I'm here driving the uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe, which is their plug-in hybrid variant, which will arrive in Australia early 2023. It'll be the first plug-in hybrid Jeep in Australia. There's other, there's other plug-in hybrid Jeep models sold around the world, not for us. Um, and it's a really interesting proposition. It's 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 very new. It's not just a new plug-in hybrid system, but it's also the new Grand Cherokee, which we okay. haven't seen yeah. yet. We'll, yeah. we'll get a five five seat version, a seven seat version, and this will be the last to arrive early next year. Awesome. Um, but without without going into too much detail, it has uh, it's very heavily focused on the off-road cred like all Jeeps are. So there's some yeah, some really cool talking points about it. But you'll have to wait for the embargo. I have to wait. Yep. Very good. But then. Um, your, the, the car now, that you I were driving, driving locally week? before you jetted off? Yes, so it's still got a plug, but it's slightly more electric. I mean, the, the Kona Electric, which is a really interesting proposition. I won't go into too much boring detail for you, but I will say this. In a world now with Kia EV6s and Hyundai Ioniq 5s, these purpose-built EV platform vehicles that look super space-age and tech-heavy and really design-focused, the Kona Electric looks like a Kona, Hyundai Kona, but with an electric powertrain. To yep. me... It, in a weird way, I think that really works in its favour. It's actually one of my favourite EVs. I, I think it's a it's a really comfy, easy car like experience with a really solid range. It makes that 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 scary leap into the land of EVs really not seem so scary at all. So it might it might what seem the, a little what, too boring, but I like it. What was the movie uh, Byron where uh, the central character had multiple pa- personality disorder? I think it was called Sybil or something like that. Was Sally Fields and uh, yeah, yeah. the Kona for me is that you know you get a Kona N, you get your standard Kona, you get a Kona Electric, you get you can get any kind of flavored Kona um, that you want. Yes, yeah, that, that was a movie, and yeah, United States of Tara is another great TV series that deals with that. With <laughs> okay. Just keeping it con- more contemporary, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Chesto. In the interest of time, we'll we'll keep moving on, Byron. Yes, what sir. have you been steering? Okay, Just give so us a, a quick rundown. A quick rundown. I've been driving the 2022 Honda Civic VTI LX. So that's the only uh, Civic you Civic can buy at the moment. Mm. Uh, I am a bit of a fan boy of uh, Civics. I owned an original Civic and I kind of get what Honda has been trying to do with the Civic. And I always thought that Civic always had a engineering premium over its competitors at a mainstream price unfortunately for the current model it has um uh it has that engineering premium in to some degree but also has a premium price so it's forty seven thousand two hundred dollars drive away wow did we just say forty seven thousand dollars drive drive away look okay on, on the plus side it drives really well it has a great chassis excellent steering like superb handling a really comfortable ride. The interior has been pared back. Uh, finally, Honda's moved away from that overly designed, fussy interior that uh, that uh, permeated most of their cars in the latter half of last mm, decade. Mm, mm. And it's very well packaged. Like, you know, it's roomy. Uh, it's got a big boot, and it's a hatchback, and it looks great. It has That's a presence good. as well. It's just too much dough at the minute. It is well, and, yeah. It's too much dough, and it doesn't have enough kit. So for forty-seven thousand two hundred dollars, you don't get front or rear parking sensors. Uh, you don't get uh, a sunroof, and they're two things I think that kind of push people away from the car. Because when you consider the alternatives, such as a Mazda three Astina uh, with the larger engine and a sunroof, it still seems to be around, I would say, ten percent too much so it's right. almost five thousand dollars too expensive but okay. that other that's the only thing really that's wrong with the car i think that if you want a quality small car made in japan now not from thailand a, a car that uh, i think takes the punch up to and beats base model a classes and bmw one series and audi a3s then you should consider the Honda Civic and maybe just right. get the dealer to throw in front and rear parking sensors. That's my Honda. Okay, good call. Um, points for the use of the word fussy in that context. I think that was that's the perfect use of that word for previous Honda Civic interiors. Yeah, uh, well you. done. Yeah. Now, um, I will close it off with the Isuzu D-Max. I've been in the D-Max SX, which is a four by two. This one's a cab chassis. Um, it's the 1.9 litre turbo diesel. So a four cylinder recent arrival. 
six yeah. feet auto it's thirty three thousand two hundred dollars so it's in the affordable end of the uh of the ute category 110 kilowatts 350 newton meters the thing i was really surprised about is how much safety and convenience tech is on board you know i put those in the plus column aeb active cruise lane keep assist auto headlights rain sensing wipers all that stuff in a 1.9 sx $33,000 D-Max, I thought was pretty impressive. Um, you can tow three and a half tons, even though it's a 1.9 litre engine. I think that's pretty good going. But on the dislike side, it is just punishing to drive unladen. The ride is awful. Um, it's also pretty holly, hollow in the mid-range, you know, that it just doesn't have the torque that you would, you would like, even though it can tow three and a half tons. If you had that hooked up to the end, I reckon it would be an interesting equation. And it's got a 12.5 metre turning circle. I found turning thing around like, whoa, this is this is really wide in the turning circle. It was a bit of a surprise. So in summation, I would say full respect for tradies not carrying a load in one of these because I'm sure it would settle down when, when you've got a load in the back of it. But gosh, I couldn't get out of it uh, quick enough um, in terms of the ride. I found it pretty hard to take. What about, right. what about the power, what about the power and torque from that smaller engine, JC? Was it uh, yep. un still enough? If it felt well, you've got enough? you've got three hundred and fifty newton meters, and that starts at eighteen hundred RPM, and that's classic turbo diesel kind of takeoff point in terms of your pulling power. Mm -hmm. But despite that, I just found the mid range just a little bit lacking. I, I wanted there to be more yeah, okay. under my foot for some urge. It just wasn't there um, in, in yeah, my okay. beginning. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Now quickly. Some feedback. Comment of the week. We're going to go with Aaron Plan, and I hope I've pronounced his last name correctly. Um, we're talking about uh, electrified cars, and he says, my wife and I were planning on replacing our Octavia wagon. First, my wife wanted a Kodiak because she wants to sit high, but she also feels bad about the fuel consumption, and I've never liked SUVs. So we started looking at the Octavia IV plug-in, but it doesn't appear to be coming here. To which I'd say, don't rule it out. Um, it's in New Zealand. It would still be a, a possibility, I suspect, for Australia. But anyway, the Peugeot 3008 plug-in or Volvo XC40 are desirable but expensive. Then we test drove an EV6 and placed a deposit on the spot, despite the long wait. I'm not going to claim that is a rational financial decision or that it's squeaky clean, though better than the average Aussie vehicle. But it's just so cool, a little weird, and not a Tesla, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I reckon that's a really interesting case study, isn't it? And the and the EV6 does look so cool. Um, so it's also far and away the best driving electric vehicle at the moment. They've done such a great job with with the ride and handling there. Yeah. Um, but it is a bit weird. And I, I yeah, I, I dig it. I think it's awesome. The EV6 was a good call. Yeah, and okay. I, I disagree with one aspect of what he said, and that is uh, maybe not a sound financial decision. I mean, given the popularity of that car and the waiting list, yeah, maybe probably a smart thing to buy it and then flip it after a few yeah. months. Yeah, yeah. You Who knows? He might start but a market I, in EV6s. Mate, I do suspect there's going to be more and more people taking that. It's just not a Tesla approach. I, I think Tesla's fast becoming like the Camry of uh, of the EV world. You just see Model 3s everywhere now, which is why I like the Polestar so much as well. Primarily because it's not a Tesla, and it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, and I think it looks awesome. You know, it's interesting to see that sentiment reflected in in the real world, thanks to Aaron. Yeah, okay. Now, with that, we've reached the finish line. So, oh, I, I want to say uh, thank you, Byron, and thank you, Chesto. Thanks for joining us from the other side of the globe. You're welcome. And uh, thanks to our bride kidnapping expert, in-house wizard, and Rasputin impersonator, Mr. Pritchard, for his digital slicing, dicing, and reassembly skills. Uh, today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, i got to see the candy first, then I get in the van. I'm not stupid. Um, a camo <laughs> kilt and hamburger Nikes. Uh, jump into the conversation, Cars Guides on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple Podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. Thanks for the kind words, Seikos. Thank you. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, a mate of mine told me every time a bird craps on his car, he tucks into a plate of spicy wings on the front veranda just to show them what he's capable of. <laughs> Some of your best, JC. <laughs> <laughs>